Now, the way I'm painting this picture, it looks like we've got this sort of odd scenario of, or maybe not so popular, common one of a mainframe in today's systems. But, you know, this is actually a very common thing happening all over the place in all kinds of organizations. Imagine you've got Project A, and it's literally ongoing. It's not 15 years old. And in B and C and D, and, you know, some of these things can be really old and some can be new. But the question is, well, how on earth are you going to get all of them to talk to each other? Because, you know, you're all inside the same company. And essentially, the idea here is to get these disparate systems to all be able to interact with each other in a kind of mesh too, right? It could look like this. It doesn't have to go A to B to C. It could be A to F, and then maybe the data coming out of F needs to transfer over to H. How do you get these sort of disparate systems to all act like a single application, like a single company with a single mission, right? That is the idea behind uh, messaging. And in traditional architectures, the way this works is, you know, you, you have, imagine, um, say you have an Apache server here. And then that Apache server is connecting over to some sort of database, MariaDB, for example, all an open source project of some kind. And traditionally, the way you would do this is you would sort of think of the uh, Apache machine as the client and then look at the MariaDB as a server. And, you know, you also sort of traditionally would go, so this is your computer. This would be the sort of traditional and operating system. Uh, architectures, this would be the client, and then you'd have some server on the network that would handle uh, whatever request the client needed to, to have served. Well, this is, you can imagine this is what's called a tier, and this is a separate tier, and we'll go into more detail about what that means. But in that kind of architecture, although you often hear client-server, uh, it's more common now to call this um, an in-tier system, where in in this case is two because you have two tiers. Well, in that case, in sort of traditional setups, what's happening is that your client is connecting over to the server and then getting the request just like here, right? And this is sort of operating systems, and this is uh, this here is sort of a, well, it's kind of a, a, an application, right? So, in this case, if something happens to the Apache server. The whole system is going to go down. And really the same thing applies to the MariaDB. So this is what is known as tightly coupled because they really are connected to each other. And not only that, remember this sort of project is intended to kind of work together. But imagine some other team now is working on some other project that, that has the same sort of fundamentals. It's also Apache. And this is also MariaDB. But these two teams, all, again, at the same company, have nothing to do with each other. They, you've they haven't even met each other, the, the people actually working on these groups. So, and that's not uncommon in a large organization. So how, you know, this application was meant to do this, and this application was meant to do this. It was never meant to do this, where you connect the two together. So how do you do that? And again, the answer is queuing, message queuing, have a messaging system. These are tightly coupled in that they are connected to each other directly. These are the same way. These are the same way. That is the traditional setup. But in a message-oriented system, this changes. So if that is our Apache server, this is our MariaDB server, again, you're going to have a piece that sits in the middle. And this is no longer tightly, tightly coupled. It is now called loosely coupled, or at least not tightly coupled. And the reason for that is because, again, something sits in the middle. And this is actually interesting because if you have, you know, we could sort of generalize this. This is some sort of tier. We don't have to call it clients and servers, servers anymore. That's a tier. That's a tier. That's a tier. These are all different tiers. If you have something in the middle, you can now do something like this. You can move this here down somewhere in the middle. And now you can literally do this, connect all of these together. And you can do that in any way that you want to. This one might come in and do that. This one might come in and do that. And really, you can sort of imagine the power of this. I mean, you're talking about connecting systems that have nothing to do with each other and making them all work together as one. And this is known as a service-oriented architecture. Why service-oriented architecture? Because the tiers that I'm drawing here, all of them offer some sort of service, 
right? So this is a service, there's a service, uh, this is a service, this is a service. That, that makes this architecture that we've been drawing oriented around services. Again, this idea behind an input and an output in each of these. You can request information, go in here, and it's going to output something. And that sort of interaction can all be encapsulated inside a message. And because of this, we have SOA being the kind of, not really replacing, but being a different architecture from in tier. This is another way to look at it. So before SOA, again, you see closed, monolithic, brittle, application dependent business functions. And you can basically see what's happening. Each of these applications is going off to some sort of database and it's literally just a single connection. And none of these really talk to them each other the way we've been drawing it. But after SOA, you can see you've got these composite applications, reusable business services, as it says, a, these data repository, they're all sort of put together in a single system. Now, again, I was talking earlier about in tiers and layers, and here's a quick uh, extract from Stack Exchange showing this sort of question. In tier means dividing applications into layers. So uh, you can see his particular question, but essentially here, if you have a tier, you can consider it to be a process boundary. When you build three tier, a three-tier application, you know that the user interface, the BL or the business logic, and the database will be in three different processes, which can be on three different machines, as opposed to an idea of which we haven't really covered called layers, which are more logical. And this is essentially how the program is written. So a single tier can contain multiple layers. It's just the way that you build your application. And SOA applications can be multi-tier and they can be multi-layer, but they don't have to be. So SOA is an approach to an arch to architect the application in in that it means you are reusing autonomous interoperable remotely called components. So essentially what we just covered, services are what you're exposing out to the system so that you have a service oriented architecture. Now, of course, message-oriented architecture and SOA in particular is not only the domain of IBM, right? There are lots of other products out there, including open source. This is a comparison, a slide that we had seen from a presentation that I really recommend if you're interested that you go check out by Roman Karkovsky, who goes into a lot of detail about the different products that are available and does a lot of good comparisons between them. And what's really interesting about this is that, uh, take a look, you have Apache Active MQ, Pivotal Rabbit MQ. This is a very popular open source uh, competitor to some degree with, uh, with MQ. You have Eclipse Paho and uh, OpenAMQ. Well, another thing you have to think about here is that messaging, you might think, hmm, okay, no matter if it's IBM or if it's open source, it seems like it would be a little bit slow, right? Compared to just directly connecting over to a database. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of the initial, this is him running some performance testing. I'll let you look at some of these details. But a lot of uh, messaging in general started out in banking, financial transactions. And so they were meant to be very, very fast. And here you can see uh, some of the performance data that Roman collected. And look, take a look at this. Over 9,000 messages per second on the hardware we just looked at in this uh, two slides ago. And, you know, in various scenarios, you can see this, this is very, very quick performance, uh, very good performance, very fast performance. There's another product in the suite called MQ Telemetry. And look at this, it can, a single queue manager, we'll look at that in a minute, can handle 100,000 MQTT connections. That's, that's really pretty impressive. And really, this, the kind of things that people do with messaging in general um, are, are kind of listed here. This is on page uh, 14. A retailer wants to respond rapidly to online customer needs and have a consistent view of data that is shown at 25,000 self-service kiosks. More than 14,000 transactions are processed each second. And that's possible by combining multiple message queue, MQ queues, and letting them sort of cluster together. So it's very powerful, very fast technology.